I'm in one of my favourite places in the country, Arran, to find out why the island's landscape is changing. Hello and a very warm welcome to Lambert. Later, I'll be finding out why this forest and others like it across the island have been felled by huge harvesters like that one behind me. Up to three million trees could be sacrificed to stop deadly larch tree disease spreading to the rest of the country. Also on the programme, Ewan meets the woman determined to bring cultural diversity to the countryside. There is a lack of volunteers, a lack of senior level staffing from BME representation. But first, to the hills just above Loch Lomond. In recent years, farm tours have become increasingly popular, but during lockdown, that was off the cards. So JJ went to find out how one farmer used technology to bring a springtime favourite live to the world. This is Lennox of Lomond Farm, and over a thousand lambs will be born here in the coming weeks. But if that wasn't enough pressure to be under, they're also going to be live broadcasting their lambing sheds. And this is where we will take them into the shed and have a look at the lammies. So I'm going to flick the camera around now. And here we are, somebody filming us, filming you. Armed with a mobile phone and a decent internet connection, Kay Wilson is bringing this year's lambing to the world. So this is Dad. Anyone who came along to our tours um, pre-COVID, this was what we ended up calling the Cuddle Corner. Kay and her family took a hit last year when the pandemic put a stop to their farm tours and holiday business. But she and other farmers across Scotland didn't set about. We basically had to cancel and close down everything. Um, we came together with our um, Scottish Agritourism Group and from that we decided to come together and do a, a live lambing tour because we were all about to kick off and start lambing. So we thought, why not welcome everybody into the lambing shed with us because they can't be with us in person. Thus, the Lamathon was born. 10 farms in 2020, and this year Kay is one of 28 farmers from Dumfries and Galloway to Aberdeenshire, drawing thousands of viewers to their virtual lambing shed. We're just going to take a wee wander down and see. This is the mummy. Has she had her second lamb yet? No, not yet. <gasps> oh, we might get I'm a live Poison birth. ready. Poison ready. <laughs> Here I'm is JJ. Reds jump in if I have to. So just remember this is an interactive tour, so if you've got any questions, Please feel free if you see anything or you want to ask us anything, that would be great. I think tens of thousands of people have now re-watched the tours, even live at the time, you know, when you when you hit that red button and you go, oh gosh, and you're waiting for the numbers and then suddenly it goes from five, ten, then it goes up to the hundreds. It's it's quite a, a thrill and very exhilarating. Just got an escapee lamb. What are you doing now? Slightly daunting and worrying because you're hoping you're not going to trip over and do something, but you just have to roll with it. You're live. But folk aren't coming on to see the perfect polished production. They want to see real and raw, and that's what lambing is all about. I've got a question here. How many sheep do you lamb? So we have 1,100 black-faced sheep, so we should hopefully have about 1,000 1, odd lambs. Oh, I have a question. I, I have a question. Do you? So how old are these little ones? So they are just a couple days and these guys here were just born yesterday um, afternoon. I've done my fair share of live presenting and they always say, don't work with children and animals. Uh, I mean, this is unpredictable. These are animal children and nature doesn't wait for anyone, does it? She's doing an amazing job. No live births is streamed today, but our you from earlier has delivered. And I have just noticed in all the commotion, this sheep has just dropped out her lammy. And really quietly she's done it. While the other lamb is now up looking for milk. Nature is a wonderful thing. Okay guys, so thank you so much for tuning in. It's been great having you. Bye guys, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> thank you. Was that fun? 
Yes, it was. And I can relax now. Really? Yes. But it was fun. Was it stressful? What's it, it like? It's really stressful. Who was watching today? We had Poland. I think we had um, Oregon. We had, well, that's obviously America. We've got down in England. We've got local people. There's some local friends of mine tuned in. So, yeah, so there's, it's just, it's all over. And that's what's amazing. Well, trust me, you make it look very easy. Thank you. That's just very much good praise from you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, I mean, nothing that we've ever thought we would do before. And it's just been, it's been nice to be part of it. All we need is a mobile phone, a cheap selfie stick and a mic, and we can bring people into our life and show them a bit of reality on a farm. As a lover of Aran, I was devastated to find out that Phytophthora remorum, a disease that kills larch trees, has taken hold here. So this landscape, a landscape I adore, is going to change, and it's going to change dramatically. I want to find out if anything can be done. The fungus-like spores don't just attack larch, but the species is particularly susceptible. Andrew Jarrett from Forestry and Land Scotland has been fighting the disease on the island for years. We've got uh, in the region of just over half a million larch trees uh, on Erin, and they're mainly planted for visual diversity. Uh, larch is the only conifer that loses its needles in the winter, so it turns brown. Uh, a lot of light gets to the forest floor and promoting a lot of biodiversity, a lot of range of, of plant species. It's also very good for, for raptors, so ra raptors like to nest in larch and it's also good for squirrels as well. We are among the healthy trees just now, but a few minutes walk into the forest reveals the impact of the disease. What we can see is roughly about 4,000 uh, diseased uh, large trees, uh, the big brown patch in the middle and the big long brown patch across the, across the top being killed by Phytophthora. It's a real shame that the trees would never have been felled, they would have been left until they decayed naturally and other trees started coming up underneath them. Unfortunately now we've got to fell them. So the landscape will change dramatically? Uh, unfortunately it will, yes. Felling is the only option when trees become infected. The isolated pockets of disease that have appeared on Arran previously have always been contained by cutting individual trees down until last year. In 2020, we noticed it popping up all, all over the island. Despite our best uh, attempts at uh, trying to contain it, it is still spreading. Why has this increase happened? We think it's something to do with climate change. The warmer, wetter winters really suit Phytophthora. So what we're trying to do now is trying to contain this disease to the southwest part of Scotland and to protect the rest of the larch in uh, east and northeast Scotland. And that means every single larch on Arran is now at risk of being felled. To get to the infected larch, other species will have to be cut down too. Three million trees on the island may have to go. Taking down trees that a few years ago were perfectly healthy, how does that make you feel? It's really, really sad. It will have a major impact on, on landscape and over a number of years to come. The larch are going to disappear from Arran, but in time, new trees will replace them. Despite the fact you're going to have to take down so many trees, do you think there's some light at the end of the tunnel? We can't replant larch for obvious reasons because there isn't a larch which is resistant at the moment to Phytophthora. But we, what we will be planting is uh, more Scots pine, uh, Norway spruce, Douglas fir, but also a lot more native broadleaves. Aaron won't be the same without the larch that I remember. But in a few years, it'll be just as beautiful. This is the path up to Glenashdale Falls, something I did with my family every single year. Now, it used to be lined with rich, mature larch trees, but look at it now, none of them left. Thankfully, though, replanting has started and trees will come back. As we saw earlier, streaming has been a vital part of the way we connect in recent times. And this year, it's going to allow the return of the Royal Highland Show. There won't be any crowds at Ingleston, but more than 1,100 entries have been made for the many competitions that are going to be shown live online. In Dumfries and Galloway, one family are getting their belties ready 
and preparing for a battle across the generations. We sent Anne to meet them. Not far from Castle Douglas, Anne Bell has been rearing belted Galloway cattle for the last 20 years. What is it that you love about the belty breed? Well, they're so handsome. The temperaments are tremendous. They're just good friends. But you've had a few winners over the years, haven't you? Loads, yes. I've won the Highland Show four times. This year, Anne is banking on her heifer, Camellia. I can tell when the cattle are born whether they're going to be good ones or not. And they show themselves off. I mean, they've got to know their winners. And they do, because the ones that are winners, they're the most difficult ones to deal with. Anne is getting some competition from within the family this year. Her granddaughters are taking their belties to the show for the first time. Daisy is looking for a prize with her calf, Yvette. Well, it'll be a bit of a different experience this year because there's not going to be the general public, but it's a nice year to start, I think, because it's quieter. The atmosphere in the show ring may be a bit different, but a global audience will be able to watch all the classes online, including one with Molly's unusual ginger belty, Red Admiral. How do you think he'll perform on the day in the show ring? With red cattle, it's a very mixed bag. Sometimes you can do really well, and sometimes you're just end of the queue. It all depends on the judge and how they feel about the reds. What is it that you're looking forward to the most from the Royal Highland Show? Um, just being able to get them out, because no one's been able to see them for a year. And hopefully we'll beat Granny and pick up a few prizes. Refereeing the family rivalry is Mum Katie. Katie, what is your role in all of this then? We're there in the background. The girls will be out there doing their showing and, and we're just there helping getting the halters on and getting the animals spruced up and ready because it's a fair old job. How will you feel seeing the girls in the show ring on the day? Uh, yeah, there'll probably be a tear in my eye. I have to be honest, it, it, it's, it's a big, big thing. And I've no doubt there'll be a tear in Granny's eye as well, even if Molly and Daisy do better than her. I shall be genuinely pleased if they do. I've sort of had my day, I suppose, really, except I'm not giving up yet. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how they get on at Ingleston when I catch up with them in a couple of weeks' time. Right now, though, it's time to look at what's been catching your eye around the country. sharing your videos. Please do keep them coming. Details on our website. Gamekeepers are at the sharp end of the often controversial debate about how we look after our countryside. Antagonistic exchanges on social media seem to be on the rise. But it's no longer just online. The anger displayed towards estate staff and those who work in shooting sports is becoming increasingly personal, as I found out earlier in the year. Recent government research suggests that almost two thirds of all Scottish gamekeepers have experienced threatening or abusive behaviour at least once a year. The 150 or so gamekeepers who were surveyed had plenty to share. Some of the stories that emerged were shocking. Verbal abuse, death threats left on gamekeepers' voicemails, and letters threatening estate owners' children. Really nasty stuff. See there, Dougie, we've got some deer moving around. Uh, you don't often see that during the day. Mike Holliday is gamekeeper on Glenampole Estate near Loch Erne in Perthshire, and he's no stranger to this kind of behaviour. So tell me your own experience of abuse. 
The most serious one I ever had, it started off, my wife and daughter were walking along the, the roads, one of the roads that comes back towards the house. And this couple who you wouldn't have expected to have been sort of that way inclined, suddenly started ranting on her about shooting being not nice and all this. And the daughter was that frightened, she went and shut herself in the kennels. He then crossed down onto the bottom path and I went down and said, look, I'm not very happy with that. Uh -huh. uh, just language, quite good. And I said, well, I think you owe my wife an apology. And I said, I think you better come in. And as I opened the gate, I picked up a fence post. Really? And came at me with a fence post. Goodness me. Which was, put it bluntly, a little off-putting. In the end, I thought, this is not the time to be brave or stupid. Shut the gate, walked away. There have been minor things since where we're standing now. We've been shouted at and swore at for cruelty to pheasants and that kind of thing when you're shooting. They can disagree, they can dislike what we're doing. I don't mind. But when it gets nasty and there's a real hate in it, that's, it's, it's not nice. One factor in the abuse levelled at the gamekeeping fraternity results from the perception that gamekeepers are responsible for the unpleasant and illegal persecution of raptors. Mike acknowledges that a small number of gamekeepers have been prosecuted, but feels his colleagues are being unfairly tarnished. The vast majority are doing the right thing, and an opportunity for them to explain their work would perhaps silence some of the criticism. I think any of us would be happy to take MPs out, MSPs out. I think the more we could do that and engage with the middle ground, then the voices of the noisy few would start to get deafened out by the middle ground. Someone with differing views on the countryside is Logan Steele. He's from the Scottish Raptor Study Group. I feel particularly sorry for gamekeepers because their workplace is often their home, and their home um, is often in remote glens. Despite his differences with some of the gamekeeping fraternity, he's appalled by the treatment Mike and his colleagues have faced. It must be very annoying, frustrating, concerning for gamekeepers to um, undergo such abuse. We completely call it out. It's ridiculous and it just should not be happening. And I also think that um, with more and more people going outside in the countryside, especially people who are perhaps enjoying the countryside for the first time, there's a lot of ignorance. I don't think they understand how keepers operate, how the countryside operates, and I think there's a fair degree of um, abuse coming from ignorance. Logan and his colleagues have themselves frequently been subject to abuse from those associated with gamekeeping. He thinks a more reasoned debate is needed from all sides. The issue seems ridiculously polarised, lots of banging of heads. Well, it's not polarised. There's huge amounts of grey. And many Raptor workers, myself included, have very good relationships with gamekeepers. They're right across the spectrum, gamekeepers, stalkers, gillies, farmers, crofters. One big thing that could make a huge difference overnight would be if they stopped illegal killing of raptors. That fuels so much ill feeling amongst the general public and conservationists as a whole. I understand why people get riled on both sides. They're angry because they care about the countryside. I just hope that the conversation can return to something a bit more civilised. In Scotland's cities and towns, our cultural diversity is easy to see, but in rural areas, it can be less apparent. Ewan's in west of Ross now, meeting a lady who's out to get everyone, regardless of their background, into the great outdoors. For the black, Asian and ethnic minority groups that make up nearly 5% of our population, rural pursuits aren't always the first choice for leisure. And that's a shame, because places like Loch Marie have much to offer, as Pammy Johan can show me. So lovely to see you, Ewan. It's just the first feeling of spring, isn't it? It is, and it's a wonderful place to be this time of year. And do you know what? It's my backyard, so welcome. Born to a Sikh family in the Midlands, 
Pammy was introduced to the great outdoors on a school trip as a teenager. That trip inspired her to pursue a career in outdoor education, focusing on encouraging folk from ethnic minorities to share her love of the wild. But it was a trip to the Highlands that would really change her life. 1997, a mate of mine brought me to Northwest Scotland, right here. And all I could say was my jaw was like, is this for real? And since then, I come up here, go on these trips, and whenever I left, I cried. She moved here in 2014, running her community interest company Backbone, aimed at introducing outdoor adventure to minority and marginalised groups who might think the countryside isn't for them. It was a feeling Pammy knew herself. I'd been in the industry since the 70s and there was nobody else that had my perspective. That's how I felt, I felt very much alone, looking around and saying, well, actually, there's nobody in the industry that looks like me or has that perspective. So um, that's why we set up Backbone way back in 95. And we've been really successful. We have definitely made inroads with regards to more BME people enjoying, appreciating, accessing the great outdoors. But there's only so much backbone can do. Increased ethnic minority participation is welcome, but Pammy wants to see greater representation within the outdoor sector itself. Just look around in the organisation. There is a lack of volunteers, a lack of people in employment, a lack of senior level staffing, uh, whether it's sitting on boards from BME representation. If the sector does not have that representation, we cannot reach uh, the wide BME uh, communities that are out there. But will that not happen, Pammy? Or you're implying that there's actually a ceiling? I'm definitely implying there's a bit of a ceiling. 30 years, hey, I've had enough. You know, I'm going to be honest, I've had enough of this, actually. We've had conversations for 30 years. The sector is expecting people to come to them. We have to turn our operations on its head. I would like us to start looking at things from another perspective. It's a lack of opportunity to leadership roles within the sector. And therefore, it is the sector's responsibility to open those opportunities to all communities. And to that end, Pami is holding a symposium, getting together representatives of ethnic minority communities and the outdoor sector, with the aim of turning three decades of talk into activity. If you're serious about this, you need to action change. And this symposium is about what are we going to action? We're fed up of conversations and we made it really clear, please join this next movement that we're doing, but only if you want to action change. Well, if anyone can make that happen, I believe it will be Pammy. And if you want to know more about Backbone or the symposium, please visit our Facebook page. Now we're off to Perthshire, continuing our series looking at the Scottish craftspeople bringing a new perspective to our traditional skills. This time JJ is catching up with a builder, pushing the boundaries of his craft. These walls are part of the fabric of the Scottish countryside, but to build one that is stable without any visible means of support is no mean feat. Dry stain diking, or at least the principles of it, have been around since prehistory. And continuing that tradition is the unhelpfully named Martin Tyler. He's currently working on this substantial piece of architecture for Inner Peffery Library near Creef. Martin, this is beautiful. Yeah. But what is it? So this is a, a dry stone uh, talking circle. So it could be multi-use, um, a place for people to come and potentially get married, do poetry readings, uh, come and sit and eat their lunch and just enjoy it. Is it as easy to build as you make it look? Unfortunately not. There's quite a lot of rules and techniques that you have to follow to make sure the wall is going to last the test of time. So talk, talk me through it. You, you get your stone and then you immediately look for the face. Right. So you pick the nicest face of the stone. Oh, a beaut. And then when you lay it in the wall, you want all the length going in the wall. So 
Right. Strong is long, strength and length. Right, so unlike brickwork, where you're kind of going with a nice big surface area at the front. Just forget everything about brickwork. There's no, right. <laughs> no cement. It's all just positioning, weight of the stone. And then once you lay your stone, you go for these little guys here, which call your, your packing or your hearting, it's called right. in Scotland, or your pinning stones, and, and jam it all in to make sure there's no wobble. When you look at a, a dry stained dike, all you see is the face stones yeah. and then the look of it, but inside there's a whole, there should be a whole lot going on. So it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, but there's no picture. So how does your approach differ working on something like this against something out in a field? Um, aesthetics, agricultural work. People viewing that wall are gonna be sheep, most in this part of the world. So they're not too fussed with how it looks, if that makes sense. Farmers like the wall to be functional. A big thing for me is kind of the heritage and the tradition. Right. It is a heritage craft after all. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, if the dry stone wall is built correctly, right stones in the right places, there's no real reason why it shouldn't last a long, long, long time. All right, so famous last words then. My, my little patch so far, w w how long will that stand? <laughs> That'll stand for a long time, JJ. I think you've done a good job there. I'll, g I'll give you a job. And I'd probably take it. As building sites go, it's better than most. You don't have your radio on, I notice. This is, the, this is the sort of place, in fact, this is probably one of the few places where I don't feel the need to, to have a radio, because you just listen, and just listen to the river and the birds. It's beautiful. Beautiful. That's almost it for this time, but there's lots more coming up in the next programme. Saving the planet with agroforestry. We are getting judged by whether we are emitting carbon or whether we are carbon neutral or whatever. Our markets are looking for us to provide a net zero product. And bee business, crucial key workers on our fruit farms. We've got around about half a million honeybees, busy pollinating all the cherry blossom in here at the moment. Wild bees can't cope with the amount of blossom that's on the site here, so we've got to bring some more bees in. Please join us for that and much, much more. In the meantime, from the Lambert team here in Arran, thank you so much for your company. Bye for now.